Um, so I just want to welcome everybody. Hello. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Simone Cordery Cotter. I am a climate analyst for Sierra Business Council, and I'm also the program manager for Sierra Climate Adaptation and Mitigation Partnership. This uh, webinar series is, um, is courtesy of Sierra Camp and our local government partnership with Pacific Gas and Electric. Um, thank you very much to those of you who are with us. Uh, just a few housekeeping things. I have muted everybody, so if you need to ask a question, um, please use the raise your hand feature or type your question in the Q&A box. Um, I highly recommend that as our presenters are um, going through their presentations because we have the Q&A at the end, um, please go ahead and um, feel free to type your questions into the Q&A so that we can address those at the end of their presentation. Um, everybody is muted at the moment due to the fact that um, we are recording parts of this webinar and I just want to ensure that um, uh, I just want to ensure that we have the highest possible um, recording quality and um, limit as much background noise as possible. Um, I will um, give everyone during the Q&A session, I will give everyone the ability to speak and ask their question um, if they raise their hand. So I'll need, um, if you uh, want to be allowed to talk during the Q&A, please do raise, please use the raise your hand function. Um, I'm gonna try to resist the urge to unmute everybody at once, um, as I know that we're all at home in this brave new world and trying to figure out how to reduce the background noise in our various places, so. Um, all right, so I think that's all for um, kind of housekeeping that I've got. Um, Really quickly, I just want to let everybody know that Sierra Business Council is working very hard on um, economic recovery and resilience for our Sierra Nevada communities. Just want to let everybody know that our Sierra Small Business Development Center is open and um, operating full steam ahead. Their website is sierrasbdc.com. Um, they are assisting a number of small businesses in the um, five county region that they serve, six county, excuse me, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Wow, can't count today. Um, they're assisting uh, businesses in their county region uh, with processing um, economic injury disaster loans as well as um, paycheck protection program. And on their website, um, which I have a screenshot of right here, which you can access at crsbdc.com, they do have um, federal updates. So as the um, addition, as the multiple federal programs are either replenished or renewed or changed or expanded. Um, those updates are going on their website. So I highly recommend that you check their website out if you have questions about how those programs are being expanded and how um, local businesses, small businesses, um, farmers, and other um, folks who have been impacted can access that economic assistance. Um, also just wanna call out for Nevada County. There's a um, Nevada County Small Businesses Facebook group um, and that's kind of a, a, a space where uh, small business, businesses can go and check in with each other. Um, and then uh, statewide, if you're a nonprofit organization, calnonprofits.org um, is doing an excellent job of keeping their website up to date with additional information. So um, just so everybody knows, these slides will be available afterwards. So I know I'm buzzing through this pretty quickly and we'll send those links out afterward. Um, just FYI for everybody, this is part one of a three-part series. Um, today is resilience funding and implementation. Um, May 28th, we'll be having an ESCO 101 energy, about energy services companies. And then June 25th, um, we'll be having a, uh, another webinar on building community support for energy efficiency and renewable integration. Um, the descriptions are all in there. I'm not gonna um, read them. We'll, I'll, like I said, I'll send the slides out afterward, but um, I'll send that out along with registration links for the next two if you're interested. Quick agenda for today just so everybody knows what we've got coming down the pipe. Um, and we've, we're lucky to have Angelo Campus here. He's the founder and CEO of Box Power. Um, he'll be going over an introduction to microgrids, design considerations, financial optimization versus resilience, and key considerations, including permitting and interconnection. Um, just FYI, um, our Q&A session is not gonna be recorded. Um, and uh, a lot of that is aimed at um, ensuring that our attendees can ask really open and honest questions. Um, so the Q&A session will not be made available as part of the recording, um, and, uh, uh, but the actual presentation itself will be available um, and will be recorded. So just keep, a, um, just keep that in mind. 
Um, following Angelo and his Q&A session, we'll be joined by Scott Murdishaw, who's the Senior Advisor of Regulatory Affairs for California Solar and Storage Association. He'll be talking mostly about the state's self-generation incentive program. And then after that, um, we'll be joined by Carrie Sinoff, the Project Manager for Sierra Business Council, and she will um, discuss the project support that you can get from Sierra Nevada Energy Watch and additional pg e funding for projects. So with that, um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Angelo. Um, Angelo, I'm gonna go ahead and stop my own video and I'm going to um, just turn it over to you and let you do the screen share. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, I will get my screen sharing as soon as possible. Okay, great. Okay. You guys can confirm if anyone can see my screen. Angela, I can see your screen and it looks fantastic. Awesome. Um, so I'll start with a quick introduction to myself, uh, Box Power, just so you know who I am, where I'm coming from, and uh, where I've gained some of this knowledge and experience. Um, but first, quickly, I was born and raised in Nevada City, grew up and went to high school here. Um, I spent uh, my undergraduate studying civil engineering and anthropology at Princeton University, and then after graduating there, started Box Power Inc. in 2016. We are a commercial, residential, and governmental microgrid developer specializing in containerized and turnkey microgrid systems that we have deployed across North America, ranging from Puerto Rico to Hawaii, New Jersey, Alaska, California, um, over the last four years. So a uh, brief history of Box Power. Um, we were initially funded by the National Science Foundation starting in 2011 as a university research project to develop rapidly deployable microgrid solutions. Um, we were then funded by the EPA to develop uh, low carbon intensity alternatives to generators for emergency backup and rural electrification. Um, that led to the commercialization of some of the technology we developed through that university program um, as Box Power Incorporated. Starting in 2016, um, our first sort of major uh, uh, public appearance was after Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico. We were a first responder there deploying containerized microgrid solutions to power schools, medical clinics, uh, nonprofit uh, logistics centers um, after the hurricane and then again this year with the earthquakes. Um, we've also done a wide range of projects ranging from um, indigenous Inupiat uh, village electrification in Alaska where we've powered two um, communities uh, in the northwest Alaskan province. Uh, as well as projects here in California dealing with grid instability um, due to wildfires and public safety power uh, shutoffs, um, as well as supporting both customers and communities that have non or unreliable access to electricity. Um, the way that we've done that that's a little bit unique is uh, we specialize in turnkey and containerized systems. Um, we prefabricate solar battery generator inverter and control systems into various size containers ranging from uh, our mini box line which is about the size of a kitchen table and has a battery bank inverter and generator inside and a solar array on top to uh, our larger solar container which is a commercial size system in a 20-foot shipping container and then we've also done a wide range of custom and more traditional systems as well. So all of that is just to give you a little background on who I am, the type of experience and the sort of lens and uh, perspective I'm coming from. I am unabashedly pro-renewable and pro-microgrid. I will try to give a fair and impartial uh, comparison between the benefits of different backup power sources, solar battery generator, but obviously I wouldn't be uh, running this business if I didn't think that renewable microgrids were the future of the electrical grid. So take my biases into consideration. Um, just some overview of the projects we've done, uh, ranging from uh, remote off-grid boy and girl scout camps, medical centers in Puerto Rico. In the bottom left, you see one of the communities in Alaska we powered with 
three of our containerized systems, um, off-grid commercial, off-grid agricultural, as well as grid-tied resilience centers, such as in Puerto Rico, where they've been uh, predominantly schools, uh, government, and medical facilities. Um, so that's enough about box power. Um, everything I say from here on out is uh, an attempt to be general towards the microgrid industry and the process and experience that you might have if you begin going down the path of uh, considering or developing or procuring a microgrid system. Um, the first and probably most important question to get into is, wait, what's a microgrid? Um, five years ago, no one was talking about microgrids. Very few people knew what microgrids were. Today, there's a lot of people talking about microgrids, but the term is thrown around pretty loosely without a lot of specificity to what exactly a microgrid is, what a microgrid isn't, and the different types of microgrids that exist. Um, one of the most thorough definitions I've found is from a uh, Berkeley lab, um, and that is that a microgrid is a localized group of electricity sources and loads that normally operates connected to and synchronous with the traditional wide area synchronous grid, the macro grid, uh, but can also disconnect to island mode and function autonomously as physical or economic conditions dictate. So try to underline a couple of important things. One, a micro grid is almost always or always a geographically localized uh, group of electricity consumers. That could be a neighborhood, that could be a university campus, that could be a government facility, or even a small area of a community. Um, the second important point here is that a microgrid is defined as a system that normally operates connected to and synchronous with the traditional grid. Uh, that's an important distinction. A lot of people ask, I have a backup generator. Is this a microgrid? And the answer to that is no, it's a backup emergency source of power. Um, a microgrid is defined by its ability to operate in connection and synchronize to the traditional grid um, during normal operations. The second question people often ask is, well, I've got solar on my building. Is that a microgrid? And again, the answer there is no, um, because a solar system without a battery bank cannot function autonomously without the macro grid. So a traditional solar array connected to the grid generates power during normal operation, connected to and synchronous with a traditional grid, so it passes the first check, but it can't function autonomously without the grid in an island mode. What that means is if the power goes out, you can't use your solar system without a battery bank. Um, conversely, if you look at a traditional backup generator, a backup generator passes the second test. It can function in islanded mode, functioning autonomously from the larger grid, but it does not pass the first definition which is that it normally operates connected to and synchronous with the traditional wide area grid. Um, this comes down to a control ability that really is what defines a microgrid, is that it's able to switch between two modes of operation. And it can include batteries, it can include solar, it can include generators, it can include controllable loads and the ability to turn on and turn off loads. But what really ties them all together and makes it a microgrid is that it has the ability to switch between what is typically a financially optimized performance, that is the ability to reduce your energy expenditures by either selling electricity back to the grid and to the utility, um, like a solar array, or by shifting some of your loads from hours of peak demand to hours of off-peak demand, such as with a battery bank, or for some commercial customers, even using a generator strategically to generate power during peak hours is a somewhat common practice in the commercial and industrial space. That's the financially optimized mode of performance. A microgrid by definition also has an island mode. That is where you stop the financially optimized performance 
and you instead move towards a resiliency performance mode where your goal is to minimize or completely disconnect from the macro grid, your main utility, and be self-sufficient in your energy consumption, enabling you to continue operations during planned or unplanned outages and to be unaffected by sudden changes in the availability or quality of grid power. So I know I spent a bit of time on that, but I think it's an important thing to, uh, to think about here with, uh, in a time where the term microgrid is thrown around so frequently. Um, and I'm happy, of course, to come back to any of these slides uh, later. Um, I can't see the Q&A session questions from my screen. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I can. Um, I'll be checking this periodically if people submit questions. Um, if you have an urgent question, I will try to answer it in the process of the presentation. Otherwise, I'll come back to it at the end. Um, I'm going to try and leave at least 15 minutes for Q&A. Angelo, I can keep an eye on the Q&A section for you as well. Awesome. If you can let me know as any questions pop up, sometimes it's helpful to answer them in the flow instead of going all the way back. For sure. I gotcha. Um, I'm now going to walk through some examples of microgrid projects. Uh, again, disclaimer, these are all microgrid projects that Box Power has done, um, simply because these are the ones that I have the most information and knowledge of and can provide some background into both their purpose as well as their performance and what went into the design of them. A recurring theme that I'm going to keep coming back to throughout this presentation is that trade-off between financial optimization and resiliency. When you are considering or designing a microgrid system, those are the two primary driving factors that will determine the type, size, performance, and cost of a microgrid system. Now, it's not always a complete trade-off. Sometimes those two things go hand in hand very well, where you can have a cost-saving resiliency microgrid, but there are often some trade-offs in terms of how many hours or days of autonomy you want without the grid, as well as how large of a generation capacity you install. A really good example of this uh, sort of hybrid approach where it is both a financial and a resiliency microgrid is uh, one of two systems, uh, community scale systems we've installed in Northwest Alaska. This is in the community of Buckland uh, through the Northwest uh, Arctic Native Association, which is a regional tribal corporation in that area. We were contracted to design, procure, and install a solar battery microgrid system with two purposes. The first purpose was financial. This community is an isolated community in the Northwest Alaska that while it does have a grid, that grid is primarily powered by fuel oil generators, which due to the remote location and the cost of storage during long winters results in extremely high cost of energy for this community. So their first goal was to reduce the amount of fuel, the amount of energy that their community had to import in order to power about 450 homes, a school, medical clinic, governmental offices, water treatment plant, et cetera. Um, the second goal of this project was resiliency. They had had issues with intermittency in their grid due to their power generation station having to be shut down for maintenance, as well as several years earlier, they had installed a wind turbine. The wind turbine produced a lot of power when it was windy, but without a battery storage system, they weren't able to store that excess renewable power when it was producing more than was needed um, to use during times of low wind or solar. So that was the resiliency component, was enabling them to maximize that renewal usage, minimize their fuel consumption, and reduce outage times. Um, this was accomplished with a solar array, three of our 20 kilowatt solar containers, a large lithium ion battery bank, a inverter system and a microgrid controller that was able to convert the solar energy, store it in the batteries, enable them to turn off their power generation station uh, in order to perform maintenance and for routine services, 
And also, uh, we'll see on the next slide here, um, reduce their fuel consumption and their greenhouse gas uh, production significantly. The total cost of this project was about $220,000. The annual savings on that system in avoided energy consumption from their grid was about $41,000. That resulted uh, in an un unsubsidized return on investment for the community of about five to six years and a lifetime savings of about $600,000. Um, the additional solar generation in the community it enabled them to offset about 114,000 pounds of CO2 per year, which over the anticipated 25 year life of the system uh, comes out to about 2.2 million pounds of CO2. Um, so this is just one of example of a, a hybrid uh, resilience, financial and environmentally motivated microgrid system. Uh, the second example I'll bring up is one of our projects in Puerto Rico. Uh, the reason I bring this one up is it was a purely resiliency motivated system. There were savings, but that was not the primary concern of the organization. This system was delivered to Arecma, which is a Puerto Rico community foundation that provides family care services to a remote community in the southeast of Puerto Rico. And this powers a community center that consists of a laundromat, a co-working space, a doctor's office, um, and several rentable community rooms and gathering place for the community. And after Hurricane Maria, they lost power. And uh, three months after Hurricane Maria, we delivered this microgrid system to provide power until the grid returns and then to provide resiliency after the grid did come back. So in total, they didn't have power at this community center for over eight months after the hurricane. This system was designed to be able to meet all of their baseline critical loads. Critical loads is another term I'll talk about in a little bit, and that's the idea of critical versus full facility loads. And then once the grid did return, this system provided them resiliency, protecting them from additional outages. Um, this last year, uh, in January 2020, a series of earthquakes hit Puerto Rico and they, again, the national grid went down and this community center was able to stay open because they had a resiliency microgrid. As you'll see from this, this system also has a financial return, but it's not as good as the one in Alaska because the primary motivation for this system was resiliency. Um, the upfront cost was about $100,000. The annual savings in avoided grid electricity is about $10,000. So you see the return on investment is about 10 years, almost twice that of the system in Alaska. The environmental benefits are still significant, 50,000 pounds of CO2 avoided per year, 1.1 million over the life of the system. This is an example of a system that was designed for a purely resiliency benefit. Angela, we have a quick question. Um, the, the question that came up is, what is the average cost of maintenance over the lifespan of these microgrids? Can you speak yeah. to that? Absolutely. Um, it's difficult to provide an average maintenance because it, it depends on a couple of variables. Location, obviously, being one of them. It's a lot more expensive to wash solar panels in Alaska than in Puerto Rico. Um, and also the actual design of the microgrid. The largest influencing factor on that is whether or not a generator is also included in the microgrid. Maintenance for solar and battery systems is minimal. Um, a large scale 50 kilowatt solar array plus battery bank, the maintenance cost will be less than $1,000 per year because all that is required is a safety inspection and panel washing. And that has to happen a minimum of once per year, up to twice per year, depending on the dust and uh, um, the dust and the uh, condition that it's in. Um, a generator, on the other hand, depending on how frequently you use it, requires significantly more frequent maintenance. If you're using a propane or diesel generator, you should expect two to three service and preventative maintenance uh, calls per year that we would 
usually estimate in the two to three thousand dollars range, bringing the whole system maintenance up to three to four thousand dollars per year. So again, depends a little bit, um, particularly with a generator. I did see the second question there of the wind speed rating of the systems. Um, our systems in particular, of course, that depends on the design, depends on the engineering. Box power systems come in two different wind ratings. Um, one is 120 miles per hour. That is for the majority of the contiguous US. Um, then we offer a high wind and snow load system that we use in Alaska and Puerto Rico where there can be you know, up to 16 feet of snow and hurricane force winds. And that system is rated for 188 miles per hour. Um, Unless there's any other questions, I'll go on um, quickly here. Uh, another system, this is in California, this is in Concord. This is an example of a commercial system purchased by a metal fabrication facility to reduce their energy costs. Um, they, uh, due to power quality and limitations, basically they were not able to get enough power from uh, pg and or the grid that they were forced to use a generator in order to power their welding equipment um, and some of their other industrial machinery. Um, they purchased one of our systems and what I'm going to show you here is this sort of return on investment calculation and one of the important considerations that you will have to think about um, and that is whether or not you want financing for your system. Um, the general uh, rule is that if you have access to your own capital, the lifetime savings of a system are going to be higher. That's represented by the difference between this blue line, which was their cost of diesel generation and grid electricity at the site, compared to the red and yellow line. The red line represents purchasing a microgrid system for its upfront cost. It has a high capital cost, but a very low operating cost. And the immediate reduction you see there in year one, that's the investment tax credit. That is the rebate that you get when you purchase a system for its upfront cost. You pay that upfront cost, and then as of 2020, you get 26% back in your, um, as a tax credit on your federal taxes. I'll talk a little bit more about that later as how that pertains to nonprofit and tax exempt industries, because that's an important consideration. The uh, yellow line here is a energy service contract. That is where the system is financed to the customer, in this case for a 15 year lease to own option, during which the cost of that upfront capital investment is spread out over the 15 year financing terms. Now, for a lot of customers, this makes it a lot easier to get a microgrid you're going to not have to come up with that upfront $100,000, $200,000. You're going to pay a monthly fee that typically covers all of the operation and maintenance. You don't have to think or worry about it. Someone else is covering the warranty. Someone else is guaranteeing that system is going to work. But if you look here, projected out to year 20, the savings from an energy service contract are going to be lower than the savings from an upfront capital investment. Um, the exact difference depends on the financing amount and the interest rate, but typically if you are maximizing for financial return, coming up with your own sources of capital are often a uh, more cost advantageous or financially optimized route versus if you don't have access to that capital, an energy service contract is a good way to go. Um, last one here, this is a, another um, medical clinic installation we did in Guayama, powering a, it was a, a school that serves as an emergency medical clinic during disasters such as hurricanes. This system was installed for a purely resiliency benefit. There is no financial return for this system because they were getting free electricity to begin with. Their issue was that when the grid went down, which in Puerto Rico since Hurricane Maria, and uh, even before Hurricane Maria, they had a high uh, uh, outage factor. They had um, frequent outages due to power quality. This system enables them to maintain operations during the uh, normal course of a power outage, and it was grant funded. The reason I showed you this one is to see what it looks like when a power outage happens. Um, this power outage was a good example because they didn't know it happened until a neighbor came over and told them. 
the grid went down at about 10, 15 a.m. on January 29th, 2020. The green level here uh, shows the battery state of charge and the, uh, the graph down on the bottom shows the energy generation going into the battery bank. And as you can see at 1015, the grid cut out and the battery immediately started discharging in order to support the full load of the school. There was no interruption in power. There wasn't even enough of a flicker for them to realize that the power had gone out which can actually be a problem, and we can talk about that later in terms of how you're managing your critical loads versus your full facility loads. Um, and they've only found out there was an outage because some neighbors came over to start charging their phones and computers because the school still had power. So just a little anecdote of how a successful resilient system is used and implemented and sometimes not even noticed. Um, the next couple of slides that I have are about, um, so I've convinced you that microgrids can be either a good financial or resilience investment. You are interested in pursuing a microgrid for your facility. What are the steps and what is the process and thought process that you should go through to accomplish that? Um, the first one, and I would say the most important step is to clearly define your own goals for a microgrid. As a uh, result of this sort of popularization of the microgrid, suddenly everyone wants them, but they aren't always sure exactly what their priorities and motivations are for that microgrid. Um, the three primary factors you should be considering and ordering in terms of, in terms of their priority to you is the savings from a microgrid, so the financial optimization, the resilience, which is typically quantified in hours or days of autonomy, that is, how many days do you want to be able to operate without a fuel delivery, without grid electricity, without interrupting your operations. And the last reason that a lot of people here are considering is environmental. How much do you care about reducing your greenhouse gas production? How much do you want to reduce that? The first thing to do is to define that for yourself. Um, part of this can be done through a process that we call an energy audit, and that's where you compare, okay, well, what would a financially optimized system look like that gave you 100% renewable usage versus a resilience one that had a larger battery bank and a backup generator uh, versus a purely savings one which might not have a battery bank um, and might not have a generator. It might just be a solar array. Again, not really a microgrid then, but from a purely financial optimization perspective, that may be the best option. So step one, figure out exactly why you want a microgrid. Step two is understanding exactly what sort of a microgrid you're gonna need and what size. There's been a sort of concerning trend in the industry uh, recently and also caused by things like the self-generation incentive program um, which provides sort of blanket funding for microgrid systems which is great and an excellent resource that we're going to learn a lot more about in a minute but um, the way that that is structured is they they base the size of the microgrid off of your total facility load and say okay you get either two or four hours of backup power that isn't enough information to accurately determine whether or not you're gonna meet your resilience goals. In order to meet your resilience goals, you first have to decide what are your critical loads? What are the loads that you want to keep operational despite any outage and for how long? Hours, days, weeks, indefinitely. Um, and the second is your full facility loads. Your critical loads will determine your resiliency priority. Your full facility loads will determine your financial sizing and optimization of the system. And it's very important to understand the difference between what are my critical loads and how big are they, how many kilowatt hours per day do they consume versus what is my full facility load, which is your financial potential for offsetting. Step three and probably after step one, the most important and the number one reason that we see projects either stall or sometimes not get completed at all is setting realistic timelines. 
accounting for the procurement process, and most importantly, the permitting and interconnection process. Generally, right now in year 2020, the technology risk for microgrids is really low. We figured out the technology exists, it's proven, it's well established, there are warranties for all of it, but the regulatory and logistics risks are high. That is because permitting for microgrids is still a somewhat uncertain and scary process for a lot of authorities having jurisdiction, and the utility interconnection process, that is the process of applying to your local utility for an interconnection agreement to begin operating your microgrid, can take longer than the entire design, construction, and installation process. And I'll repeat that, the interconnection agreement can take longer than the entire microgrid construction process. That often isn't accounted for and results in projects completed halfway, stalled or not installed when they're needed. So research your timelines, talk to your building permits, and talk to your local utility. Um, step four, find a technology partner you trust and watch out for snake oil salesmen. There's a lot of them, um, particularly with the popularization of microgrids and the chronic outages that we're seeing here. There are more and more uh, sort of novel, magical, too good to be true technologies being offered and marketed. Um, be wary of new technologies, do your diligence and research, go to many of the regulatory agencies that can support embedding a project, and uh, make sure that you're getting something that is well established and proven. Um, as part of that, convenience often comes with a price. I mentioned this a little bit with the energy service versus the uh, um, the upfront capital cost, figure out, make sure you're getting a good deal. Um, it's not uncommon for energy service contracts to take the majority of the savings from a project. If convenience is your only priority, that's fine, but just be aware that if something seems no upfront costs, no commitment, just sign on the line and we'll take care of the rest, you probably um, are paying for that convenience somewhere. Um, Step five is understanding your ownership structures. There are a variety of different ownership structures, including being an owner operator, an owner with a third party operator, an operator with a third party owner, such as a lease agreement or an energy service agreement. Research and understand the differences between these, the pros and cons, and why you would want to choose one or the other. And finally, step, step six, is understand your incentives, understand your subsidies and the rebates available to you. Um, this year in particular, the investment tax credit is still at 26%, but steps off very rapidly over the next couple of years. Um, so make sure that as you are planning, if and when you're gonna do a microgrid that you are maximizing your access to that tax credit. And even if you are a nonprofit or tax exempt organization, there are ways to benefit from the investment tax credit through a creative financing structure. There's several organizations and financiers that specialize in providing investment tax credit benefits to nonprofit and tax exempt organizations that can help you figure that out. Um, finally, the big buzz this year is the Self Generation Incentive Program or SGIP, which we are about to learn a lot about from Scott. Um, and is probably one of the biggest and most important subsidy opportunities that's ever been available to California. That's all I got today. Um, I apologize if I went a little bit longer than I, I want. I hope we still have some time for the Q&A. And uh, this is my contact information. I'll leave it up here for a minute. I'm happy to chat offline, provide any information, and uh, thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Angela. That was incredibly thorough. Um, so we're going to go ahead and move on to um, our presentation with Scott Murdishaw, who is um, joining us. He is the Senior Advisor of Regulatory Affairs for California Solar and Storage Association, and he's going to cover um, the state's self-generation incentive program, and we're very, very happy that we have him joining us today. Um, so Scott, hang on. Give me just a moment while I make sure that you're Good to go. Um, okay, Scott, we'll go ahead and test audio. Okay, hi, can you hear me? Flawless, excellent, thank you so much. Okay. 
All right, I'm gonna go ahead and mute myself and turn off my video. Um, Scott, take it away. Okay, thanks, and you see my screen, right? Yes, I can see your okay. screen. All right, well, thanks so much for having me. So I'm Scott Murdershaw from the California Solar and Storage Association. I'm a senior advisor for regulatory affairs, and uh, I'm responsible for most of our storage-related work. I've been representing CALSA uh, at the PUC uh, during the development of the self-generation incentive program. And before joining CALSA, I was, I was at the PUC for a little over a decade, uh, working on a variety of things. Um, and so I'm happy to be here today. There's a lot that's been going on with uh, the Self-Generation Incentive Program, or SGIP. The PUC has issued uh, several decisions since August of last year that have profoundly reshaped the program as a response to the, uh, the power shutoffs and wildfires, uh, and has focused a lot of the program much more on uh, helping medically vulnerable customers and ensuring that critical facilities have access to storage solutions to provide backup power. So let me get into that. <clears throat> uh, on, I'm having a problem advancing my slides. There we go. All right, so first, just to give you a sense of the structure of SGIP and the different types of project categories, uh, as far as the, the incentive levels and some of the uh, program requirements are concerned, First, you have the general market, meaning that in, these incentives are available to uh, residential and non-residential customers with very few restrictions, as long as they receive service from one of the three large electric investor-owned utilities or SoCal Gas, uh, which has also been a part of the program since it was first launched in the wake of the electricity crisis. Uh, as long as you're a customer of any of those four large utilities, um, then you are eligible to participate. That covers the vast majority of the state, uh, with the exception of some areas in the far north <clears throat> and other more remote areas of the state, um, uh, and a handful of publicly owned utilities that provide both electric and gas service. So in the general market, there's two broad, there are two broad categories. Small residential, those are for systems that are sized at or below 10 kilowatts of capacity. Uh, that has its own incentive budget category and its own uh, uh, now incentive rates. And large scale is everything else. So that's any non-residential installation as well as any residential installation greater than 10 kilowatts. Now, in addition, the, uh, a recent decision has also added a resiliency adder, which means that you get an additional bonus if uh, you are a critical facility in a non-low-income area. And I say non-low-income area because there's a separate budget category for critical facilities that serve <clears throat> low-income areas. And I'll get into more detail about what a critical facility is uh, in a few slides. And, and then there's a much higher incentive level for uh, the equity budget. And the equity budget is reserved for low-income residential customers and then government agencies, educational institutions, nonprofits, and small businesses in certain qualified low-income areas. And government agencies uh, have an, some additional flexibility. They are also eligible if they serve at least 50% <clears throat> disadvantaged or low-income census tracts. So they do not necessarily need to be located in one of those census tracts, but you do need to demonstrate that you serve a majority of uh, those kinds of qualifying census tracts. And then the equity resiliency uh, budget, which has the highest incentives, those systems must provide backup power. Not all storage systems are configured to do that. Some are installed purely to provide uh, bill savings. So <clears throat> uh, projects taking advantage of this uh, incentive level have to demonstrate that they can provide backup power. And this, uh, the highest level of incentive is available only to certain low income and medically vulnerable residents in areas that are prone to power shutoffs or critical facilities located in or serving these low-income areas uh, that are also located in the fire threat districts and other uh, areas prone to power shutoffs. So these are the incentive levels for those different categories. The general market, large scale, uh, these are unchanged from previous incentive levels. If any of you have had experience with or are familiar with the program from the past, uh, these incentive levels have, have been in effect for several years. Uh, as 
capacity is uh, claimed under the program, the incentive level step down. So for the large scale, uh, the incentive current steps are uh, across all the utilities are in step three, with the exception of PG&E, which still has some money left in step two. And I'm <clears throat> focusing on steps three and five here, three through five. Those incentive levels are 35 cents, stepping down to 30, and then down to 25 cents per watt hour of capacity. For the critical facilities that qualify for the resiliency adder, they get an additional 15 cents per watt hour. So what that means is, uh, for example, a critical facility in a high fire threat area uh, would, could receive 50 cents per watt hour, 35 cents at step three, plus 15 cents per watt hour for a total of 50, uh, or that would be $500 per kilowatt hour of battery capacity installed. A small residential, that category has already uh, gone through the first five incentive steps. So there are uh, two new steps that have been recently added, step six and seven, and those incentive levels are 20 and 15 cents per watt hour respectively. So you can see that the equity incentive is much higher uh, and does not differentiate between residential, large or small, uh, and there are no steps. So for the remainder, the next five years that the program has been authorized to operate, that incentive level will not change. It's 85 cents per watt hour. And that should cover most of the cost, uh, fully uh, installed cost of most energy storage systems. And the equity resiliency <clears throat> is even a little higher. It's basically like the equity with the resiliency adder. So an extra 15 cents per watt hour bringing it up to a dollar per watt hour. And that was by design uh, uh, an incentive level high enough to cover all or virtually all the installed cost of most energy storage systems. Just a quick snapshot of the current budget status. <clears throat> um, you can see at the top, this is the small residential for those residential systems size 10 kilowatts or less. There's a little sliver of money uh, in step five. It is all gone in the pg e territory uh, and is mostly gone in the other service territories as well. So step six and seven together gets you to a, a little over $50 million of incentive, uh, incentive uh, budget left there. Large scale, a lot of this is carryover from the previous several years. And in addition, the uh, commission decided to add some additional funding there, so the budget is much higher, 300 million. Uh, and there is still a fair amount of step two money left in the PG&E territory. It's gone in all the other service territories. Uh, equity residential, and this is residential of any size. So uh, unlike the general market, there's no distinction between 10 kilowatt and less or greater than 10 kilowatt. It's just purely on the basis of the customer type. Uh, and that, <clears throat> that budget uh, is about a book. 25, a little bit more million dollars uh, left, but that budget category has been moving pretty slowly, although the incentive levels were increased substantially in one of those recent decisions. For the non-residential, the budget is about uh, $50 million, and that's the budget category that we think is likely to be depleted uh, first, uh, potentially within the first several months of the program. Equity resiliency, you can see, is uh, now accounts for the vast majority of the total uh, the total program budget at over six hundred million dollars of incentives available. Uh, and then just an overview of the implementation schedule, the large scale general market uh, is open now. Um, small residential is technically open, but on a wait list throughout most of California, waiting for the step six to be added. The equity and equity resiliency incentives will be available beginning May 1st, so next week. Um, they were supposed to be up and running already, <clears throat> but the program ran into some technical glitches uh, in the application portal, and so that was pushed back to May 1st. Uh, there's been some confusion uh, because of that delay, but uh, we have received plenty of assurance from the program administrators that they will be able to stick with the May 1st date. The resiliency adder <clears throat> and those new small residential steps are still uh, in the process of being approved uh, in the, through the final implementation proposal from the utilities and uh, the other program administrators. Uh, and so the, P, the PUC is currently reviewing uh, their, their final detailed implementation proposal 
And we think that those should be available uh, as early as June, certainly by July. So I'm gonna first talk about the eligibility criteria for the equity budget. All of these eligibility criteria are uh, pretty confusing and there are a lot of details. Uh, we've been getting a lot of questions from our member companies about this. And I'll focus on equity first because a lot of the um, eligibility criteria for the equity resiliency incentive uh, are based on, <clears throat> based on eligibility criteria for the equity, but not necessarily resiliency uh, budget category. So for single family, <clears throat> excuse me, for single family, the household income has to be less than 80% of the area median income. And the homes have to be subject to a resale restriction or equity sharing agreement. This ensures that if the home is resold, it will be uh, sold to another low-income family. Um, there aren't that many examples of this. Uh, are, from what we have gathered, this is a fairly small market. But in certain very low-income areas, uh, if the family has a household income uh, at the same threshold, less than 80% of the area median, then in qualified census tracts, empowerment zones, and enterprise community census tracts, uh, there is a presumed resale restriction. So in other words, you, you do not need to demonstrate any separate equity sharing agreement or resale restriction. Any households with this income level can qualify. Uh, additionally, if the customer was previously designated as eligible for the state's single family affordable solar homes program because they would have had to meet similar criteria, um, they are eligible without having to, uh, to recertify um, that they meet those conditions. And then there's a pending change <clears throat> that the commission is considering, which would allow all residences on tribal lands to be automatically eligible. This is <clears throat> some of those areas with the presumed resale restrictions where the low-income households don't have to have those equity sharing or deed restriction agreements in place. So you can see they're scattered um, throughout the state. And then moving on to multifamily, um, the, in order to qualify multifamily developments <clears throat> uh, must be uh, also deed restricted low income housing. Um, these are projects of five units or more and uh, meet certain uh, uh, tax incentive uh, or other incentive program requirements to be deed restricted. And they need to be located in a disadvantaged community. Uh, disadvantaged community for these purposes is defined as the top 25% of what's called the Cal Enviro screen tool that combines uh, pollution exposure and demographic data and creates a, a, a single score for each census tract in California. So the top 25% uh, is defined as disadvantaged communities for uh, the purposes of many state programs. Um, or even outside of those disadvantaged communities, if you have a multifamily project where at least 80% of the households have incomes less than or equal to 60% of the area median, then it qualifies. And similar to single, single family, the PUC is considering making all residences on tribal land automatically available, uh, eligible. For non-residential, uh, not all types of non-residential host customers are um, able to participate. They have to be a government agency, an educational institution, nonprofit, or small business, and small business meets a, an official state of California definition of having um, annual revenues of $15 million or less, which includes affiliates, so generally chain businesses would not apply, uh, not qualify. Um, and they need to be located in a disadvantaged community um, or a census tract with a median income less than 80% of the statewide median, or a census tract with a median income less than or equal, equal to certain county-specific thresholds. And these are uh, determined by and updated annually by the California Department of Housing and Community Services. This is also consistent with some other state programs. Um, or on tribal land, so this has been approved by the commission, the, the PUC, Collectively, we just refer to these as SGIP DACs or DACs for SGIP purposes. So the Calen Bioscreen DACs plus these other census tracts that qualify on the basis of uh, income levels or being on tribal land. Uh, as I said before, even government agencies um, that are not necessarily located in one of these census tracts can qualify <clears throat> if they can demonstrate that at least half of the census tracts served are these SGIP DACs. 
So there's a tool that you can use that's maintained by the Air Resources Board. Uh, it has a map. I've uh, reprinted the URL there to make it more visible. Um, so you can go here and enter in any address in California or a city and then get a, a map that will show you whether um, a particular location is in one of these qualifying census tracts. Uh, we've produced some maps uh, using that data uh, on income levels and the Cal Enviro screen tool, and this just provides a summary of all of those uh, qualifying census tracts. So um, just to reiterate, in these census tracts, nonprofits, government agencies, educational institutions, and so on are eligible. Um, and <clears throat> for uh, single family and multifamily residences, uh, it's less geographically restricted and more based on incomes. So let's move on to the uh, equity resiliency incentive, the dollar per watt hour incentive. So these are focused on uh, what I would broadly refer to as vulnerable customers. So these are customers who are located <clears throat> in a tier two or tier three high fire threat district or customers that have experienced two or more public safety power shutoffs. Uh, and they are either eligible for the equity budget, so going through those single family, multi family criteria uh, that I explained above previously, uh, or they are on a medical baseline rate due to dependence on certain kinds of life support devices. Um, these can be uh, res respirators and uh, other uh, kinds of medical equipment, or they uh, depend on motorized wheelchairs. There are certain other conditions that um, customers may have that require them to maintain temperatures within a narrow range. They cannot uh, be either too hot or too cold, and <clears throat> they have notified the utility uh, of this medical necessity to maintain electric service. Um, and then recently added by the commission was customers who are dependent on electric pump wells for their domestic water supply. For non-residential, <clears throat> uh, those kinds of facilities have to be what are called critical facilities. They provide critical ser services to residents in the event of an extended outage. So they too need to be located in a tier two or tier three high fire threat district, or they have experienced two or more power shutoffs. And then this is the complete list of the types of facilities that qualify. So uh, in broader categories, they, they, they either provide critical safety services like police and fire stations, uh, they are medical facilities of various types, including um, independent living centers for uh, individuals with certain kinds of uh, physical handicaps, um, or they are uh, utilities, uh, jails and prisons. And then the uh, utilities have the, <clears throat> um, the ability to designate certain types of or certain facilities uh, as community resource centers that provide assistance during power shutoffs. Um, so uh, I will talk a little bit later about uh, outreach to the utilities to get facilities designated as these community resource centers, uh, cooling centers or homeless shelters, and then small business grocery stores were recently added. Um, this is similar to the definition of small business that I discussed above, although uh, there's a little bit more flexibility in that the $50 million uh, is only applies to the specific location, not whether the um, store is part of a, a larger chain or network. Um, and then they have to serve at least one, just one of those SGIP disadvantaged community census tracts that are also located in one of these power shutoff prone areas. This is a map of the fire zones, uh, the tier two and tier three higher fire threat districts. We were also able to get data from PG&E uh, that shows the additional areas that qualify based on the uh, criterion of having experienced two or more power shutoffs. We did not have similar geographic data from SE and seg &E, but the PUC is working on, a, on making a tool available that will integrate all of this income and fire threat um, data together. Got the maps that you've provided in your presentation. Um, are you able to provide those to us either as like a, a web link or as a PDF after the presentation is over? Um, yeah, I can do that. These are maps that we produced uh, uh, for our members when we were putting together fact sheets on these recent decisions. Um, the, the one caveat I would say is uh, that I'd want to add is that we can't 
vouch 100% for their accuracy. We pulled them together pretty quickly. And we have subsequently learned that there were a couple of um, uh, a couple of errors that we made in, in determining which data sources to use. I think they're relatively minor, but, um, but these do just give you a pretty good overall sense uh, of, of where these qualifying areas are. Gotcha, okay. I think on one of your previous maps, um, we had a question if there, there was a pink dot in the middle of Nevada County, in the middle of uh, Western Nevada County, and the question was if that was Grass Valley or Nevada City or another um, part of the county. So we'd be curious to kind of drill down into that and see what, um, what particular uh, uh, metropolitan area that is. Okay. All right, well, let's, let's move on because this, this is an official um, tool here that uh, the CPUC maintains. So this is uh, for finding the uh, tier two and tier three high fire threat districts. And like the ARB tool, you can enter any address uh, or just a city name um, and then zoom in on that and, and verify whether it uh, is in one of these qualifying areas. And what this map doesn't cover is um, areas that have experienced two or more public safety power shutoffs, but uh, the PUC is working on a tool that would do that as well. So when you put these criteria together and you look at the, uh, the overlap between the income qualifying data and the fire threat district data, uh, the, the census tracts that are eligible for equity resiliency uh, ends up being a, a kind of a scattershot of census tracts that are spread across the state. Uh, and of course, as you would expect, they, they tend not to be located in larger cities because um, they are in flatter areas or near the coast or near the bay. Um, so while a lot of low-income census tracts are located there, they are not at risk of uh, power shutoffs generally. Uh, so just interesting to see how there is this dispersion across the state uh, of, of these qualifying areas. And as you would imagine, a lot of those qualifying areas are in the uh, Sierras and in the foothills. So what we see as a critical role of local governments uh, that they can play in helping SDIP succeed and with these new uh, incentive levels and incentive um, uh, programs uh, that are you know, sub budgets within SGIP uh, is one, just identifying your own facilities that might be eligible for equity and equity resiliency projects and reaching out to storage companies uh, that serve your area. We have a list of all of our member companies on our website, and you can filter that by whether they are uh, project developers and installers or other uh, types of financial or legal or other um, service providers within the industry. Um, and then uh, secondly, this is, um, this is very important because it's hard for storage installers to necessarily know uh, who some of these, uh, where some of these low-income households are located, especially medically vulnerable customers. Uh, while the utilities have this information, of course, they have a lot of customer privacy concerns. We're trying to work through that and figure out some way that they can help match make uh, between the industry and some of these um, residents who aren't medically uh, on the medical baseline rates. Uh, but I know that some uh, cities and counties maintain lists of um, medically vulnerable customers and disabled customers or, or residents. So um, anything that local governments can do to help promote awareness of the program would be uh, really valuable in helping, um, helping us with that outreach and then helping <clears throat> customers get these systems installed as soon as possible. So I'll go ahead and wrap up there. Um, that's my, my name and my email address. Um, feel free to contact me with any follow-up questions, but I'll try to answer whatever questions you have in the time that we have left. Excellent, thank you, Scott. We really appreciate it. Hi, everybody. And um, I'm hoping you can hear me and I apologize for the slight delay. Um, first, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Carrie Senoff and I will try to get through my few slides quickly because I know y'all anxious to speak with Scott and An Angelo. Um, I am a project manager for Sierra Business Council's climate energy team. I am one of six team members working within our climate and energy team as part of Sierra Business Council. I primarily work with our Sierra Nevada Energy Watch program 
or SNU, as we like to say. This program is a partnership funded through the PG&E Public Purpose Program, which all PG&E customers pay into. So the, um, the majority of the services I will be referencing today are provided at no cost to PG&E customers located in SNU territory. Um, and here is a list of the public sectors we serve and the 11 counties that our current PG&E contract covers. So where does SNU fit in? SNU provides in-depth energy planning services, project management, and energy efficiency guidance to local government agencies. Whoops, lost you there. To local government agencies, school districts, special districts, and underserved HGR and DAC businesses throughout the Sierra Nevada foothills and those 11 counties. Our climate and energy team's mission is to help rural communities move towards increased regional re resiliency and energy budget equity. This new program is designed to further energy goals through planning, analysis, outreach, education, and on the ground energy saving projects. Um, so our SNU focus, um, our program provides a variety of services tailored toward each agency and business's individual needs. Some of our services include energy planning, inventorying of greenhouse gas emissions, development of energy and climate action plans, and strategies for reducing, uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions in both short term and long term. We develop and facilitate workshops, trainings, peer groups, and EAP working groups, all focused around energy savings, providing community outreach and messaging. We also offer in-house turnkey project management services while encouraging bundled energy solutions. And basically, a bundled energy solution approach helps our customers take advantage of deeper savings and encourages sustained energy reduction. And although energy efficiency is no longer the buzz term, like it used to be, engaging in energy efficiency projects is still one of the most important places to begin with when implementing energy reduction strategies. This is because it is still considered best practice to take advantage of energy efficiency measures first, as I think Angelo was referencing in his um, speech as well. Um, and we do this in an ordering sequence so we can, um, so we can um, right size systems basically. So if we're gonna install um, solar and ba battery storage and other projects, we need those to be right size so it can adjust to the reduced load demand, which is critical as we move through increasing PSPS periods and rely more on micro grid systems for re resiliency um, and just simply for reaching our greenhouse reduction goals. Um, right sizing also helps reduce investment outlays. In addition, most energy efficiency projects can be funded through a bill neutral approach and um, future projects can be accomplished by utilizing um, revolving loan funds. So basically the savings of paying for future projects. So energy efficiency projects in retrofitting are cost effective and a great starting point before um, you move on to other energy reduction pro uh, projects. So our project management services. One of the ways, oops, hold on. Um, our project, um, so our project management services are really key in what we do. Um, we assist our partners in moving towards their energy reduction goals by offering project identification and implementation services such as identifying on the ground energy efficiency projects, outlining energy management systems, 
incorporating renewable energy opportunities, battery, battery storage, ongoing emerging technology systems when applicable, and we remain involved um, with our customers and government agencies from energy analysis through design, implementation, installation, and funding. Um, our project management services include infinite tasks, which I um, outlined some of them on the slide, and layered services to boost an energy's resources, alleviating limited staff time and freeing up funding for other commitments. This speeds up the approval process, resulting in further increased savings and further um, greenhouse gas emission reduction. So what we essentially like to think of ourselves is, you know, we're a, your coach, your partner, we're a mediator of information. Um, we provide a compact variety of services under a single program to help agencies and customers navigate through reducing energy use and lowering greenhouse gas emissions, complying with state policy, and most importantly, remaining an active um, leader in your community. Um, Just a quick question for um, clarifying for our participants that are mm -hmm. on. Um, so, you know, Scott's, Scott's call to action for our local governments was to see if they can identify their um, SGIP eligible facilities. Would SNU be a good candidate for assisting local governments to identify those? So that's one of the main things we do is we are um, your conveyor of inf uh, a convener of information. We try to, to work closely with trade pros, utility programs, state programs, vendors, um, and stay abreast of all the different programs out there. So ideally, we're going to work we're going to work through all the update information for the S chip and get that out, help community agencies um, develop messaging for that, help distribute that through our different networks. So that's absolutely what we do is we're just, we are helping um, government agencies from early onset energy planning, energy efficiency projects, working with communities, dispersing information, helping find financing, helping find um, eligible incentive rebates. And we think we're pretty inf impactful with that. But then also outside of that, you know, that's all kind of under the umbrella of our pg e work. We do all throughout the Sierra Nevadas, even for non pg e customers provide um, a, a robust offering of fee-for-service work and contracts. And we probably worked with some of you on the phone right now. Um, so that is a rundown of some of our programs. Excellent, thank you, Carrie. Um, I would just like to um, let everybody know Carrie's got her contact information up here. Um, we are still, these programs are still um, going ahead full steam, um, uh, even in light of the disruptions that we're seeing um, with the state home orders and um, various other things going across the state and the, and the world, quite frankly. Um, I haven't seen any questions pop up in the Q&A um, or in the chat, and I know that we're at time. Um, so I just want to thank everybody for attending. Um, thank you very much. I know that um, time is short these days. I really appreciate everybody coming and hanging out with us while we're doing all of this. Um, we'll make the recording available as well as the um, presentations shortly, either um, later today or tomorrow. And uh, once again, um, I'll do my best to include the contact information for all of our panelists and presenters. Um, and I just want to um, give a very heartfelt thank you to Angelo Scott and Carrie for um, putting these slides together for us and informing us, um, giving us some very valuable information on some highly relevant programs that are happening. So um, thank you all. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and um, end our webinar right now. I wanna, um, once again, thank you all for your time and um, we will talk soon.